so this picture here on the screen is for line of snow soloing with the kind of bassy band sometime in the later 1940s. Now, Marco and Laura and Christine encouraged me to examine the phenomenon of prejudice in brass with relation to brass itself, with relation to gender, and also to Black Lives Matter. It's an area that I venture into with great trepidation because it's an area full of questions with no easy answers. To look at the phenomenon, I'll go back in history to give examples from the recent past, the last 3,000 years or so, which demonstrate the belief that I've developed over our playing career of some 60 years, that there is no logical or rational explanation for the prejudices that still flourish and seem to be enjoying a renaissance in certain parts of the world. This is one of the few areas in which I personally tend to get oh, totally overcome with feelings of outraged powerlessness because prejudice is just so ingrained, long-lasting and irrational. I said recent past advisedly when I talk about the last 3,000 years as I've just written a piece of music about the mysteries of the universe and the birth of a star which made me aware that our universe has been around for some 13.8 billion years at the last count which is quite a long time and I firmly believe that our recent ancestors from the past 30,000 years or so, which Peter Holmes was talking about on Tuesday, I believe that they amassed all sorts of mental and physical capacities which we are currently in the process of losing. We continually underestimate our ancestors as we continue, as modern people, to trash the legacy for the capacity of human life on earth that they have endowed to us. But that's another big topic for another global prayer day. I can see Marco <laughs> rubbing his chin here. So now I want to slide two, which is another woman. So going back to the first written evidence we have about the trumpet, the inventor of the trumpet in Greek mythology was a woman, the goddess of Athena, the goddess Athena, who also invented many other useful things such as the ship, the chariot, the plough, spinning and weaving. She came to personify wisdom and righteousness, which I think is entirely justified for her tr invention of the trumpet alone. <laughs> and the picture shows her holding a salpinx, the Greek trumpet, which Peter Holmes showed us on Tuesday, and they're still in the exhibition and you can play them at the low, just three doors this side of the office, that's right, you can play the salpinx down there. Now, perhaps Athena is the reason for the fact that in ancient Greek and Latin, and hence in many modern languages, the trumpet is feminine. La trompette, la trompa, di trompette. Interesting, however, that the players tend to be masculine. Le trompetiste, il trompetista, and der trompeta. There are also quite a few depictions of Amazons playing the trumpet. Peter didn't count those uh, yesterday. We don't know quite whether Amazons have got this androgynous quality, but there's quite a lot of depictions 
of Amazons playing the trumpet. And here's one. And this is from the knee guard of a seamstress uh, when she was kneeling down to uh, sew up togas that needed mending. And so here you can see that Amazons were female warriors. They were packages from Jeff Bezos. So perhaps because Athena was the goddess of war as well as more useful things like wisdom, there seem to be less rigid demarcations about what females could or could not do then than came later. Having said that, however, equality for all human beings was not a concept that Greek society bought into. They did have slaves, although when all's said and done, they seem to have a more enlightened concept of the trumpet and its players than many more recent manifestations of uh, civilization. Now, in this slide, which I'm sorry is not in colour, the original is in magnificent colour, we jump from the female inventor of the trumpet to the first black player that I have knowledge of. This person is not only the first black trumpet player I've heard about, he's also one of the first trumpet players from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance period with a name. He was called John Blanc. In the courtly language of French of the time, this translates as John White Blanc. Okay? In the sort of play on words, beloved by the Tudors and the Elizabethans, in the pay books, he is referred to as John Blanc, the black trumpet. <laughs> so there are two known pictures of him. In both, he wears this turban to cover his hair. All the other trumpeters have long hair. If he was from North or Saharan Africa, he could, of course, be an adherent of Islam. And this points to levels of equality, diversity, and inclusion that the modern era would find difficult to manage. He came to England with Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife. Catherine was a champion of women's rights, a friend of Erasmus, a champion of the poor, and governed England as regent when her composer performer, King Henry husband, was away fighting his wars with the French. The English and the French, they've always had this thing. And this picture is from the celebrations that took place in February 1511 to celebrate the birth of the Prince of Wales, the future king. Unfortunately, the baby Henry died two months later, and the rest is history. Henry VIII went through six wives trying to get a son. Now, John Blank was part of a group of Africans which Catherine brought with her to London. This entourage made her something of a celebrity at the time and John Blank became part of the Royal Court of Musicians. Equal pay for all has been conspicuously lacking in many of our Western economies and is still work in progress around the world. I'm glad to say that our Tudor forebears were probably more enlightened than we are now. John Blanc was paid a significant amount of 20 shillings a month by Henry VII. He wasn't a slave, he was a free man. And after King Henry VII died, <laughs> a letter exists where Blanc very cheekily petitioned this great king Henry VIII to double his wages. Now, Henry VIII, you know, he's famous for cutting off people's heads. Now, Henry VIII must have thought very highly of John Lang's hoot spa and his trumpeting skills. 
as he exceeded without hesitation and doubled his salary. Now the Tudors and Elizabethans, it's all in the it's all in the it's all there in the papers. You can read it for yourself if you can dig deep enough. So the Tudors and, and Elizabethans seem to have been exceptionally enlightened in the perceptions of brass instruments. If somewhere quote a bit more dogmatic about the matter about female succession to the throne. Now, after 23 years of marriage and no further surviving sons, Henry divorced Catherine of Aragon and married Anne Boleyn, and his daughter with Anne le later became Elizabeth I, Queen of England. There she is. With a trumpet. But she's sitting there, trumpet players up there. So, one of the most interesting facts, to me at least, about Elizabeth I is that her bedchamber accounts show quite clearly that she possessed a great or base sackbut, a trombone for her own use. The loudest instrument available at that time. The 16th century in the British Isles was an era, an era of very powerful women. For example, it was Catherine of Aragon who defeated the Scots at the Battle of Flodden in 1513, whilst her husband Henry was away gallivanting in France. When Elizabeth succeeded to the throne, there was no male succession, and this is the first examples of females acceding to a great throne. Well, when she succeeded to the throne after her half-sister Mary, she fought a well-documented power struggle with another Mary, Queen of Scots. And this picture shows the use of the trumpet to signify Elizabeth's power. And in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of international politics, which still exists up to the present day, Elizabeth had to show that she was the match of anyone, irrespective of gender. She invented the high-heeled shoe to increase her stature, and she played the bass trombone. Good on her. <laughs> Generally, however, despite these formidable exceptions such as Elizabeth, brass instruments themselves and the music that they play have had a mixed response in public perception from the ancient world onwards and have often been perceived as vulgar, brash things to do that contort your face and are just not done in polite society. society. The sound of a trumpet was described by Aristophanes as akin to a gnat's fart. <laughs> and a gnat is a tiny, annoying insect to the non-English speaker. And uh, Aesop compared the sound of a mosquito to the trumpet, so presumably the buzz method goes back further than we formerly thought. <laughs> and Plutarch compares the trumpet to the brain of an ass. Hee-haw, hee-haw! So, then, later on, Castiglione, in his 1528 book of the Courtier, consigns all wind instruments to be a repulsive and not to be played by anyone with social pretensions. And John Essex, in his Young Lady's Conduct of 1722, says that the oval would look indecent in a woman's mouth. <laughs> Brass instruments are not even considered. Of course, brass instruments were played almost exclusively by male professional players, either in the court, church, or army, up to the second half of the 19th century. There were considerable exceptions in Italian convents, and so on, which Bruce Dickey talked about in his lecture on Tuesday. So what about the music that brass players played? Of course, the trombone and the cornetto 
by the 16th century, and then the trumpet by the 17th century had entered into secular and church art music. But when ensembles of brass players played the stuff from memory that they learned by road, usually outside as part of state and civic and military ceremony, well, of course, many authorities still do not consider it to be music. It's a form of noise with pitch which proclaims, announces arrivals, tells people that an event is about to take place. Personally, I don't hold that view. I'm more eclectic in my acceptance of what constitutes music and can accept fanfares and blasts and signifiers, no matter how short in duration, as music. Applied music, with all the background noises that goes with that, with a purpose perhaps, but music nonetheless. So let's find some of the music that they used to learn by road and play in the old days. And I'll find it somewhere here on, on John Blank's one, I think. Yeah, there'll just be a slight delay to the plays. Let's see. Come on, play. Please. <laughs>
the, the new little uh, hall uh, at the uh, Laidlaw Music Centre in St Andrews, which was supposed to open last March, <laughs> and because of the pandemic it couldn't open, so we did some stuff in there. But I played that just to demonstrate that I think that the Victorian era in Britain and the 19th century period in Europe, along with the post bellum era in the US, was an emancipating moment in history for brass instruments. It not only opened up brass instruments to people across, from, across every aspect of society, it also opened up the expressive potential of brass instruments to play any sort of music. Bruce Dickey's Cornetto had shown that this potential already in the 16th and uh, early 17th centuries, but lyricism became as important as virtuosity and declamation. And femininity, as a playing characteristic, became a prized asset, irrespective of the gender of the player. And of course, many more female players came to prominence in the later 19th century, such as Beatrice Pettit, although generally dressed universally in white as a sign of refinement. Now, and that brings me to... No, not you. No, come on, stop it. Right. <laughs> that brings me to the Juilliard School of 1904, where the trumpet prodigy Edna White enrolled at the age of 12. She had already made her Carnegie Hall debut at the age of 9 in 1901, and when she graduated in 1907, she was deemed too young at the age of 14 to receive a degree. And of course there were no jobs because orchestras were all male and army bands were close to females in the US until 1973 and it was later still in many other countries, for example 1994 in the UK. So she made all of her own work and this is her here recording for Edison in the early 1920s. Now, her musical career was a continuous uphill struggle because she was a female playing the trumpet. But she deserves uh, admiration for struggling on and becoming a role model for other trumpet players. For example, for Carol, who followed in her footsteps uh, in, a, in a later period and just showed what women could do on this bloody instrument that we men have been struggling with for so long. So, uh, <laughs> she was the first trumpet player to give a recital at the Carnegie Hall in 1949, which is very many years before trumpet recitals were deemed generally possible for both player and audience to enjoy, and she premiered new works by Virgil Thompson and George Antar, very prominent composers. Finally, the Juilliard relented and gave her a diploma at the age of 92 in 1984. So, US, land of opportunity, but wrong time, wrong place for Edna White. Around right about the same time as Edna White's early career, a new phenomenon was hitting the streets of America in New Orleans, Chicago, New York, and elsewhere, and ragtime was rapidly transitioning into jazz. Marco asked me also to talk about my infatuation with James Reese Europe's Harlem Hellfighters Band the band of the 369th Regiment of New York, which was a mixture of African Americans on brass and Puerto Rican Americans on reeds. What a combination. It took the continent of Europe by storm in 1918, and when the band 
came off the transatlantic troop ship in Brest. They played the Marseillaise up tempo and swung it. And the French have been mad for jazz ever since. And here is the man himself from the front. This is another rare photograph. So Rhys Europe was the first person to organize concerts by all black composers through the Clef Club Society set up in 1910. He put on concerts of proto-jazz at the Carnegie Hall regularly with his orchestra of black Americans playing to a totally integrated multiracial audience. And this was well before Paul Whiteman, George Gershwin, and Benny Goodman, and so on. I find it amazing, despite his achievement in transcending Jim Crow, that he's not better known. And I enjoy finding all the missing color in periods of history with strong characters like him. By the end of the First World War, the 369th Regiment fighting alongside the French, because the American army would not allow them to fight alongside white Americans, the regiment had won, the whole lot of them, they'd won the Croix de Guerre, the highest, uh, the highest decoration, the highest French honor. And after Reese Europe suffered a gas attack at the front, he commanded a, 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 a he commanded a, a platoon of machine gunners. Uh, he was invalid, invalided to Paris. And then the band performed at the Tuileries Gardens and for an unprecedented eight-week run in the recently built Théâtre de Champs-Élysées, where, just five years before, Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring was first performed. So, on arrival home in New York, the 369th were given heroes' welcomes and Europe's band led a victory parade for seven miles. Can you imagine marching for seven miles and playing all the way up Fifth Avenue to Harlem? Then tragedy struck. Three months later, he had the dubious distinction of being the first African-American to be given an official public funeral parade in New York after he was stabbed fatally by one of the drummers in his band. He told them off for giggling and leaving the stage for a performance. And one wonders how different the history of American music would have been if Herbert Wright, the percussionist, spend night had missed the artery in Reese Europe's neck. By ending as 1912, it's remarkable how different Reese Europe's Clef Club Orchestra was for his first Carnegie Hall concert than the New York Philharmonic, which Gustav Mahler conducted for his last ever concert just a year earlier in February 1911 in that very same Carnegie Hall. For a start, and this is counterintuitive, Reese or <laughs> Europe's orchestra was bigger than Mahler's. It had 125 players, which included a plectrum section of 85 mandolins, guitars, harp guitars, and banjos, and a rhythm section of at least 10 upright pianos. So here's Rhys Europe sitting at the piano with his society orchestra before the First World War. Of course, America came into a little bit later, and this is around about 1917. He was known for his outspoken personality. Again, good on him, and his insistence on playing his own music. In his own words, he said, we have developed a kind of symphony music that no matter what you think is different and distinctive. My success comes from a realization of the advantages of sticking to the music of my own people. 
We colour people have our own music that is part of us. It's the product of our souls. It's been created by the sufferings and miseries of our race. So that's James Reese Europe. 100 years later, in our field, music, I feel we've not come far enough along the journey that he and the other remarkable human beings I've talked about in the last half hour would have liked. One of the problems is that all the big countries, the major players we should be looking up to globally, have a patchy record in human rights and social justice. And we small people, we musicians, feel powerless to change anything. But change will come through small local actions, through small countries, small regions, small states, Small is still beautiful, and music education can play a leading role in promoting equality, as it always has done when it's free enough to do so, as it is here in the folk band in Essen. And as Louis Armstrong thought to himself, and said, and sang, despite everything he'd been through in his life, what a wonderful world. The world that we live in is truly amazing. And we, as musicians, through our work, can celebrate this ultimate reality. And what's more, we can all do our bit to collapse the irrationality of prejudice amongst human beings on our planet to make it even more wonderful for everybody, irrespective of race, gender, or creed. Thank you. Presenting that 
And I think I've developed a chip on my shoulder <laughs> from being a brass bell and not being given more things to do. And I think that's why you'll find in most orchestras around the world and so on, brass players becoming on the board and the chairman, you know, the Vienna Philharmonic, the chairman's often been a trumpet player, in the LSO, a trumpet player, or a tuba player, and so on. And so they, um, they always want to, and that's why so many brass ensembles started up as well, because people felt underemployed in orchestras because all of the lyri lyricism was given to the, you know, strings, and all the making love was given to the flute and the oboe and the, and the, and the, and the trumpets and uh, uh, Gina you know, got have this ceremonial thing. So we, we are used, but we felt that we could always do much more. And even on the Baroque trumpet, when you hear some of the things of Handel and Bach, they are really quite, some of those composers were looking for really lyrical things on the on, on the on the instrument. So um, now I think the being hired by kings and queens and things was quite important for the trumpet because it gave them more money to live on. And John Bland had a wife and kids as well, you know, which is amazing for a black man in London in the 16th century. He had a wife and kids, and uh, so. That sort of patronage, I don't, uh, I, I think it's quite good for the instrument, but you've provoked a lot of thought, I'll have to think about that question, because I haven't really answered it very well. No, no, I, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go for lunch. Let's so what I'd like to say, what we will say, uh, uh, I guess Barry will announce it too, that uh, we, we have this, uh, we're going to meet Carl Ryland after the afternoon break and uh, we have a, a brief uh, conversation with Selena and Hart. Um, and after that there is a, a round where we just hope that we can just be together as uh, all the people who are hanging around this week and have a, a Q&A. Uh, so we, we hope to just be in the theatre over there, I think, you know, or here, I don't know. What time will that be? Um, that would be... Yes. 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 yes, so, so it's 3.30. Yes, it's here on the screen. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So it's 3.30 here, and then we have a lot of chance to uh, yeah, ask questions. Yeah. And good taking conversation.